Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the University of Bristol. My name is Andrew Kelly from Bristol Festival of Ideas, and we're delighted to launch this new series, the Coleridge Lectures, tonight in association with the University of Bristol, with Bristol 2015, the European Green Capital Company, and with the Cabot Institute here. Uh, we're delighted to be working with all of those as part of this work. We're focusing on the Romantics in our spring season this year, not only um, because of the subject of, of poetry and the land and nature, uh, but also because of their association with Bristol, which a lot of people don't know about. So if you come to this series of lectures, um, next week, for example, you'll be able to pick up your own self-guided walking tour of Bristol and follow in the footsteps of Wordsworth and Coleridge and Hannah Moore and Annie Yearsley uh, as they went around uh, the city. Um, the Coleridge Lectures are a new season of lectures that we're launching, um, six to seven free lectures each year um, on a specific theme. This year's theme is on radical environmentalism, um, and um, we're delighted to have such a wonderful range uh, of speakers as part of that. Our first Coleridge lecturer this year is Kathleen Jamie. Kathleen is a poet, an essayist, a professor of creative writing, a wonderful writer, and um, her books include Sight Lines and Findings, her book of, of essays, and a wide range of poetry publications, award-winning poetry publications, um, which she's going to be reading from uh, as part of the evening tonight. What we're going to do is, Kathleen's going to speak for about 20 minutes, read some poetry, read some of her prose. We're going to then have a discussion and then open it up for questions and comments uh, from you. Once again, many thanks for coming. I hope you enjoy the first of our Coleridge lectures. Uh, would you welcome Kathleen Jamie? I thought uh, I would begin with a piece of work I wrote exactly at this time of year, because certainly where I live, and possibly down here, this is the time of year when the light suddenly reappears after the winter. It's as, it's a, as sudden as that. So couple of pages to welcome the light. Every year in the third week of February, there's a day, or more usually a run of days, when one can say for sure that the light is back. Some juncture has been reached, and the light spills into the world from a sun suddenly higher in the sky. Today, a Sunday, is such a day, though the trees are still stark and without leaves, the grasses are dry and winter-beaten. The sun is still low in the sky, even at noon, hanging over the hills southwest. Its light spills out of the southwest, the same direction as the wind. Both sunlight and wind arrive together out of the same air, an invasion of light and air out of a sky of quickly moving clouds, working together as a swift team. The wind lifts the grasses and moves the thin branches of the leafless trees, and the sun shines on them in one movement. So light and air are as one, two aspects of the same entity. The light is razor-like, edging grasses and twigs of the willow and apple trees and birch. The garden is all left-leaning filaments of light, such as you see in cobwebs mostly, too hard to be called a sparkle, too metallic, but the whole garden's been given a brisk spring clean. Where there are leaves, such as the holly 200 yards away, the wind lifts the leaves and the sun sweeps underneath, all moving because of the fresh wind. Now the town's jackdaws are all up in a crowd, reveling in the wind, chack-chacking at each other. And I hear a girl's voice, one of my daughter's friends, one of the four girls playing in the garden. She makes a call poised just between play and fear. What are they playing? Hide and seek? No matter. It pleases me that my daughter says they are playing in the garden because they're 11 years old. Another year or two and they won't admit to playing at all. And for a while the garden will have no appeal because everything they want will be elsewhere. For a few years they'll enter a dark mirror tunnel whose sides reflect only themselves. The girls themselves can't be seen, obscured by trees and that edgy, breezy light. The year has turned. Filaments and metallic ribbons of wind-blown light just for an hour, but enough. Okay, now, uh, maybe a few poems, yeah? 
I thought I'd read perhaps some poems from my, my last book and then a few that I've been working on more recently. As I've, I've decided, to, I decided to change my, my way of writing just for an experiment. So this will be the first outing for that experiment. But first, some properly made poems, nicely behaved poems, <laughs> stanzas and everything. Um, this one is called Hawk and Shadow. I watched a hawk glide low across the hill, her own dark shape in her talons like a kill. She tilted her wings, fell into the air. The shadow coursed on without her like a hare. Being out of sorts with my so-called soul, part unhooped hawk, part shadow on parole, I played fast and loose, keeping one in sight while forsaking the other. The hawk gained height, her mate on the ground began to fade, till hill and sky were empty, and I was afraid. So we're out in the, out in the hills now, as you might have noticed, and we'll, we'll stay out there for several poems. Um, the next place we're going to is the Cairngorm, where a friend took me to see um, stags, stags, hundreds of them. There's a place he knew um, where the stags gather in the winter. I didn't know they did this. Gather in the winter, and it, it, I was taken there to see these animals. The stags. This is the multitude, the beasts you wanted to show me, drawing me upstream all morning up through wind-scoured heather to the hill crest. Below us, in the next glen, is the grave, calm brotherhood, descended out of winter, out of hunger, kneeling like the signatories of a covenant, their weighty, antique, polished antlers rising above the vegetation like masts in a harbour or city spires. We lie close together, and though the wind whips away our man and woman smell, every stag face seems to look towards us, towards but not to us. We're held and hold them in civil regard. I suspect you'd hope to impress me, lift to my sight our shared country, lead me deeper into what you know, but loath to cause fear you're already moving quietly away. Sure, I'll go with you as I would now, almost anywhere. Mostly, um, I enjoy my encounters with the natural world, but you know, this meeting with a spider freaked me a bit. You know, it's a big spider. Um, not in this country, in Spain. I think it was a wolf spider. Whatever that means. It's a big job. Just hang in there. The spider. When I appear to you by dark, descended not from heaven, but the lowest branch of the walnut tree, bearing no annunciation, suspended like a slub in the air's weave, and you shriek, you shriek so prettily, I'm reminded of the birds. Don't birds also cultivate elaborate beauty, devour what catches their eye? Hence my night shift, my sulphur and black striped jacket, poison, a lie to cloak me while exposed, I squeeze from my own gut the one material. Who tore the night? Who caused this rupture? You, staring in horror, had you never considered how the world sustains the ants by day, clearing, clearing, the spiders mending endlessly? Now, what shall we have now? I, th I was thinking of this book, which I published two or three years ago, is a midlife book, and uh, it's called The Overhaul, for that reason. And um, that all happened, published the book, and only afterwards did I have my real midlife crisis. And, you know, <laughs> kept quite seriously ill. But, but uh, back in the day, um, the, the, the cover illustration is a lino cut by James Dodds. It's... Um, Shetland Foreen, which he very kindly made specially for the book. And you can be sure it's accurate, because if, if you know his work, you'll know that's what they look like. So this is a poem about a boat, which 
I and my friend Tim D here discovered on a shore in Shetland some years ago. The boat's called The Lively. Look, it's The Lively, hauled out above the tide line, up on a trailer with two flat tires, what, 14 foot, clinker built, and chained by the stern to a pile of granite blocks. Both the bows still pointed westward, down the long vaux, down toward the ocean, where the business is. Inland from the shore, a road runs for the crofts scattered on the hill, where washing flaps and the school bus calls, and once a week or so, the mobile library. But see how this duck egg green keel's all salt weathered, how the stem, taller like a film star than you'd imagine, is raked to hold steady if a swell picks up and everyone gets scared. No, it can't be easy when the only spray to touch your boards all summer is flowers of scentless mayweed, when little wavelets leap less than a stone's throw with your good name written all over them. But hey, lively, it's a time of knife, life thing. It's a waiting game. Patience, patience. Well, I figured um, you can't be alive in the world and be a writer and never address the moon. So the moon is addressed two or three times in this book, and I don't care. The first time is called The Study. Moon, what do you mean entering my study like a curiosity shop? Stroking in mild concern the telescope mounted on its tripod, the books, the attic stair. You who rise by night, who draw the inescapable world closer, a touch to your gaze. Why query me? What's mine is yours, but you've no more need of these implements than a deer has, browsing in a glade. Moon, your work-worn face bright outside unnerves me. Please, be on your way. What should we do next? I'm wondering whether to read something in Scots, would that be okay? Yes. Every so often I like to, to work in Scots. It's um, just keep it alive. And um, when I can't think of what to, to, to write, I, I like to do occasional translations. This is a wee fragment from Holderlin called Half a Life. Been with yellow pears, full of wild roses, the braes fall into the loch. Ye mince with swans, drunk with kisses, duck your heads to the douce, the haley water. But whar when winter's wears will a fin flowers, whar the shadow and sunlicht of the yard. Dumfinnet the was stone, the cold blast claters the weather veins. This, this poems in this book which pertain to different times of year and it feels odd to read autumnal poems now. I don't know if I can quite bring myself to do that. They will have to wait. But um, I'll do one from September time, the time when the, the, the wee flowers that are known variously as bluebells and harebells in different parts of the country, I mean the ones on the single, single flower on the stem. Is that a bluebell or a harebell? Yeah. Right, yeah. We say bluebell. <laughs> It's called an avowal. And uh, the, I wrote this poem after starting my, 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 the job that Andrew alluded to as, as professor of creative writing, which seems like such a good idea at the time. <laughs> and the first thing, I, I, oh, I went and took up the job and that was great. And the first, very first thing we had to do was go to a staff meeting. <laughs> it went on for two days. We went to a hotel, <laughs> you know. And after two days of, of oh, acronyms and spreadsheets and, and that. After it was over, I ran out of the hotel and up the hill. I say run, I mean went, you know, fled and lay down. And when I came back to my senses, I sort of looked to, to my right and there was a little bluebell on its stem, nod, nodding in the wind. And I, I swore then I had to keep, you know, Keep it in with the bluebells and not with the spreadsheets. But it's, it's difficult. I'm sure there are university people here and medics here and teachers here. You know how difficult that is? 
an avowal. Bluebell at the wayside, nodding your assent to summer and summer's end, nodding on your slender stem, your undemurring yes to the small role life offers you. A few weeks seasoning the hillfoot grasses with shakes of blue. You accept and acquiesce thereby to any wind, though the winds tease. Flower, they ask, do you want to be noticed? Yes, yes, noticed. Or rather left alone? Yes, left perfectly alone. <laughs> Flower, they whisper, do you love the breeze that wantons the whole earth round, breathing its sweet proposals, but does not love you? Then laugh when your blue head nods. I do, I do. So, that little slim book took about seven years to amass, you know, and um, you get to a certain age, you realise you don't have that many decades left. Yeah. So, um, about this time last year, obviously I'm Scottish and we were having a bit of a moment last year, and uh, there, was, there was such, such energy, and still is, but there was such energy about the place. I thought, I, I want to participate in this. I cannot let this go by. And um, aside from being out in the street shouting weird things about the BBC, there was other ways of participating. <laughs> and, um, and I thought, right, what I'm going to do this year is write a poem a week, every single week. So it was a way with a well-made poem. Usually it takes me six weeks to finish a poem, so I do about six a year. But having to do one a week was a great challenge, more like doing a blog or a sketchbook. And if it wasn't perfect, then to hell with it. Yeah. So maybe I, I shall do two or three of these. So it also meant I had to sc scamper around finding things to write about. You know, sometimes it was memories, sometimes it was things that were happening, just whatever presented itself, and keep that awareness. So, so what they lack in well-madeness, they make up for in, in energy and vibe, I think. So we started the year with the, the first time the blackbird started to sing. Merrill is Scots for blackbird. Merrill. Thon blackbird in the briar by the outfield dyke doesn't know he's born, doesn't know he's praise and part of this Sabbath forenoon, North Atlantic style. From his yellow beak his song descends to spring's first celandines, his throat patters. With a yellow claw he scarts his left lug without interrupting. Soon the har will burn off, but for now the blackie's the centre of the world's eye, till there he's flown. I went to New York, and I went on a bird watching trip around Central Park, which is great. So this is called Wings Over New York. One of the Central Park red-tailed hawks hunched in a leafless maple pecking at a polythene bag. When it flies, the plastic traps its talons, so the raptor plunges head down, dreadful, winged pendulum, and everyone gasps. But with three strong beats, it's free and soars. Where are they nesting, someone asks. I heard on Dakota this year, above the American Natural History Museum. There's hermit thrush, fox, and swamp sparrows at the pond side. And elsewhere in the ramble, a tiny NYPD siren scythes, a starling high in a red oak. The Hinds is the next poem, and it's a sort of um, companion piece to the one about the stags. So this is the Hinds. The Hinds. Walking in a waking dream, I watched 19 deer pour from ridge to glen floor, then each in turn leap, leap, the new raised peat dark burn. This was the distaff side, hinds at their ease, alive to lands held on long lease in their animal minds, and filing through a breach in a never mended dyke, the herd flowed up over heather slopes to scree, where they stopped and turned to stare the foremost with a queenly air, as though to say, aren't we the bonniest company? Come to me, you'll be happy, but never go home. <coughs> and I'll, I'll close with a wee poem about a tree. I have a lovely um, student, 
a friend who's a student from Shetland, and she, she's um, very good at the Shetlandic dialect, and they have a word there which is, is unique, for one's spiritual home, the place one comes from, the croft on the hill that's absolutely yours. It's Bonhoga. And she's telling me about this Bonhoga. And I thought, oh, I want one, you know? Because I, I was thinking in my mind, where, where would my spiritual home be? I'm Fallos, Bonhoga. I can't think of anywhere except perhaps the lane we played in in the back of the Wimpy Scheme when I was growing up. And I thought, well, maybe that's it. And at the bottom of that lane where the garages were, where we played, there was a scabby old tree. That's my world tree. What kind of tree was he on, stationed like a beggar at the bottom of our lane, where we braved on scooters and wee bikes? It marked our world's end, maimed, relic grey, past the last back gate where fields began, growing from before they built the scheme. That was where we hunkered, through till the gloamings of our pre-teens, knees drawn up to our chins, whispering sweet horrors. Crone tree, tribal root, I haven't thought of you in years, but wonder now what kind you were, elder or hawthorn, bower or may, and why I suddenly care. Thank you. Can we start with about nature writing? Because one of the things that reading your work and, and reading about your work is, um, is, is how difficult it sometimes is to classify someone. And you've, yes. in terms of nature writing, we've mm -hmm. seen this huge growth, rebirth recently, oh. of which you've played a, a central role in that. But would you consider yourself a nature writer? Oh, no, no, no. There's a, there's a lovely essay in The Guardian at the weekend about you know, why do we have to label writers? All writers hate it. All we want to do is be writers. And I'm old enough now to have been a Scottish writer, a woman writer, and I'm a nature writer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it wasn't one of the worries about, um, I read that they were worried about your work being put in the mind, body, and spirit <laughs> section or whatever that, um, that, uh, no, that came not, with. Yeah, that, that was my publisher's worst nightmare, but yeah. it's never happened yet. <laughs> Oh, well. But I asked you to, to read some poetry because I wanted to talk about the prose because that, you know, particularly in, in findings and sight lines. Um, one of the things that, about your approach, really, it keeps coming up about how you, the need to look closely at something mm. and, and, to not, and also to look beyond, if, even if you don't think anything's there. Talk a little bit about your approach. Perhaps give a couple of examples from, from some of the places you've been looking. Um. I have great admiration for people um, who, who can look very closely at the world. That includes bird watchers, ornithologists, pathologists, you know, anybody who's, whose job is to be still and concentrate and look. You know. And so it's through admiration for that that got me interested in it. I have no claims to be a, a great looker, so to speak. But I, I learn. And also people who listen, you know. I like being around people who listen because they don't feel they have to talk all the time. You know, they're, they're attending to other things. So um, being with these people makes one slow down and attend. And it's that quality of attention that, that um, began to, to matter to me and I wanted to emulate. So I don't know if I can provide uh, um, examples, but um, that... Is what I aspire to. I don't um, want to succeed. God knows life doesn't allow you to half the time, does it? But that's one of the things that comes yeah. in because you're, you, you jokingly said that that had taken seven years mm. to, to write, but you, your ability to, to, to look and listen over a very long term, and not just in the wild, but in, you know, nearby. I read somewhere that you, you had one foot in the city and one foot in the hills as part of your, your yes. biography. Yes, when I, when I grew up. Yeah. Um, as ex I think I think um, I think it was uh, very formative. We lived um, in the outskirts of Edinburgh, so as you say, one bus ride would take you up into the Pentland Hills, the other bus ride would take you into the city centre. And, uh, yeah, I like that. And you've really spent a lot of time in both areas, haven't yeah. you? Because mm -hmm. you find wonder in the in the city or the town as you do in the... Yeah. In the, in the I mean, yeah. you, you wrote a lot about the birds you see, for example, in Edinburgh one mm -hmm. day, but mm -hmm. then you talk about the birds when you were out with, with the radio producer and so on. Sure, yeah, I don't... Um, I like being in the town as well, yeah. Yeah. I don't flee it. 
So, um, but what? Um, and, and you also talk about the importance of, of simply walking and, and looking around and, and walking around and so on. And cycling, there's a lot of cycling. Well, I, I cycle more than I walk, because yeah. it's quicker. Yeah. You know? And um, I do admire people who, who can walk for 20 miles, but I just can't be arsed. <laughs> 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 the choice between that and do it and go on my bike, I'll go, I'll go on my bike, which has just been serviced and out of the repair shop only yesterday, so that definitely the year's turning. They're very popular in Bristol, it's among some people, but not yeah. with others with the cycling. So it's, um... What about um, when you, you grew up? I mean, one of the things that, that um, you, you benefited from was, uh, you, at one point, you tell this wonderful story about going on an archaeological dig um, as a very formative influence mm. in terms mm -hmm. of you, about landscape and about mm. writing. Tell, tell us a little bit about that and why that was important to you. I think the essay you're talking about is in here. It's called yeah. The Woman in the Field. And when I was uh, 17, I left school with absolutely no, no am ambition and no sense of future. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew what I didn't want to do. I uh, didn't want a job in an office, which just seemed to be all that was being held out to, to me. And um, people, we weren't a university going family. I was, and still am, the first member of my family to go to university. So that wasn't on the agenda. I thought, what am I going to do? But I was interested in, in um, antiquities and ley lines and standing stones and stuff. So I thought maybe archaeology. And those days, people here will remember this, they used to advertise for volunteer diggers in the back of the Guardian. I think it was the Guardian, you know. So you could spend your summer just budging around from one dig to another. And I did that. I went to one not so far from my home in Perthshire. as a Neolithic henge and spent probably a very short space of time there. But it was, as you say, hugely formative. And um, I, remembered, I remembered about it, obviously. And only 30 years after, when I was, you know, a writer did I think I want, I want to write about that so it's strange to go back 30 years and have images and ideas that have been kicking about in your head for so long you know that they fi finally find their find their home find their place you know that's a strange business that time I mean time and writing is, is, a, is a strange one yeah but I wonder if 30 years ahead so I better get on with it now if I need to <laughs> <laughs> I'm not asking you to read anything from it, don't no, worry. No, I'm just a... trying to remember myself. There's a, couple, there's a picture of myself in this book at, at that dig with the curly hair and a cigarette. And the, <laughs> my children are horrified by the cigarette. The roll-up, you know, the mean roll-up. Mum, you didn't smoke. <laughs> just there, well, we'll let you look at that later on. So. <laughs> but, but also, just filling in some of the background, university was really important for you, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Because mm -hmm. you talked about the kind of there was a wonderful term as um, an aware woman you were regarded as amongst a group yeah, of that was feminist a, people. That was a f phrase like the communists had fellow travellers. Yeah. You know, it was sympathetic but not, but not committed. And uh, feminists had the phrase aware woman. And I thought, I just, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I'd rather be an aware woman than be labelled. So, yeah, and university was incredibly important because it gave space, just four years, you know, just to, to catch up with yourself and think. I, I signed up to do English literature, and that was a mistake. I went to one lecture and thought, nope, yeah. And uh, so, so when I come to events like this and I'm told it's about the Romantics, I think, I don't know anything about the Romantics. I know nothing about literature, you yeah. So I was, in a, I was very nervous. I thought I'd be asked about Coleridge and, and, and things. You know. we'll, we, we, we'll test the audience and not the speakers <laughs> at some point. No, no, really, the purpose of this series is to, like anything we do, is a, is a kick-off point for a wider mm -hmm. discussion. Mm -hmm. And what, what your work offered us was the chance to look at writing in a very broad sense mm -hmm. of nature, romanticism. I mean, you're, very, you're quite critical of romantic writing. I mean, there was a, that wonderful essay in the London Review of Books she wrote about Robert McFarlane. What, what did you call him? The, <laughs> the, the, Poor the Robert. enraptured lone male conservative English writing. Was that something which... Um, which um, now you're putting words in my mouth. I didn't um, say the word conservative. OK. <laughs> Self-centred, was it? Or, no, no. I didn't say that. What, 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 what puts you off that kind of writing? Because you talk about the kind of, you know, the, 
uh, over gushing language and so on. Is that, is well, that is, any, any poet is going to balk at over gushing language, mm. but um, it's, it's, it's unfair to, to single out one particular um, practitioner, I think. We, we, won't, we won't do that. But uh, my own tastes just run to, to the lean. I mean, as, as in my poetry, I prefer things leaner, more honed down, fewer words, fewer words rather than mm. more. And uh, I, I actually don't like music for that same reason. You, know? mm. you hear music, I hear noise assailing me. And so it's a similar horror of just too much. What is it? And I can make a quotation. Is it Keats who said, uh, we had a horror of any writing that had intentions upon us, you know. So. But these, but weren't, your, these weren't your first book. I mean, you, you actually did a... It's difficult, again, to define it, but you did the book Among Muslims. Mm -hmm, that was... Mm -hmm. to, what, what, what set you off on that? And what... what on well, that particular book, it was finding myself in, in an extraordinary situation of being in um, northern Pakistan on my own and being befriended by a family of... Um, a Shiite family there, who had, there was many girls in the family who were about my own age, and they, they sort of took me in because the, the idea of my being a lone female, unprotected, was anathema to them. They couldn't, could not deal with it. And so, but being female, I could enter the family, you know, in a way that a, a strange male couldn't. So I found myself sort of embraced by this, this lovely family. And uh, that became the, the, the major part of that book. And it absolutely breaks my heart what's happened since. Absolutely breaks my heart. I had, at the time, a lovely idea that we'd maintain this friendship down through the generations and my children could go and meet her children. Awful. You know. And you went back after 9-11 and wrote a... Yeah. Uh, mm. a not a follow-up. After 9-11. And it's just all gone to hell since. It's mm. just worse now. Isn't it? Mm. And then your, but your, your, your poetry books started to be published, but your first book was... Was a, well pamphlet at the age of twenty, wasn't mm. it? That you, 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 the the black black spiders, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yes, I published that because nobody told me not to. You know, I don't know if I would do it again. Mm. I think if I had my life again, I'd arrive fully formed at the age of thirty. But uh, I had, I had a batch of poems, and there was a rumour going around Edinburgh that there was a publisher who wanted to publish poems. So I, I took them to his house. This is so old-fashioned, isn't it? I cycled, I cycled to his house with these poems in an envelope and left them on his doorstep, you know, like an abandoned baby. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, he sent me a very nice postcard saying, come and see me. And um, he, he was into paper, he just loved paper, you know, and, and production values were sky high. And so he lavished all this paper on me. How was that? But it set you off on this career. It set me career. off, yeah, for sure. And, uh, for and sure. you were able to, you know, things mm. like support from the Scottish Arts Council. Yeah, and the late so lamented, uh -huh. Yeah, and um, so, so what, how do you write, you know, poetry and prose? Do, mm -hmm. do, you, do you, you commit, you know, you're committed to writing a poem a week? Do you, what about essays? You're not writing an essay. Hell week, no, I haven't written that essay for years. <laughs> No, I, I haven't written much prose of late. Usually they go along in tandem and mm. I'll be writing things and not knowing which they're going to be in the end. And occasionally I'll write a piece of prose and think, no, nope, that's a poem, and recast it as a poem. Mm. Don't think I've ever done it the other way. And what about, um, I mean, with the, um, with findings, it was, there's a lot about your, the, the, I mean, you talk about, your family and the fact mm. that you, you had a young family, yeah. you couldn't really travel very far. Mm. And with the other one, you were able to travel. A, a wee bit more, yes. Yeah, so. yeah. But you, your family feeds into this and into the poetry quite strongly, doesn't it? Well, I, I, again, I don't see... Um, that's my life, mm. you know, and it's the life... I think a lot of people responded to finding, especially women, because that, that's our lives, mm. you know? And you can't just traipse off over the hills on your own for six weeks because, yeah. you know, the kids need their fish fingers. Mm. And uh, that was... Um, mm. I wrote, uh, you, you mentioned the book about Pakistan. When, when I was young, I could do that kind of thing. And then when the children came along, obviously I couldn't. I pined for it. I would love to go back to the Himalaya. You know, maybe one day I will. But with small children, that wasn't going to happen. So I did think to myself, like, what, what is the biggest adventure I can have and still be home for tea? You know? And that's, that's what I did with, mm. with findings. You know? I managed to get away for five days, I think. That's the longest, longest trip. 
But that's why that book came about. And it's mm. also why the, the essay form suited. Yeah. You know, that's also a childcare issue. Mm. You, know, you, can, you can write 7,000 words mm. and perfect it. I couldn't have done a sustained novel or anything. Mm. You tried though, didn't you? Oh, everybody tries. <laughs> I have no interest in character, no interest in narrative, and so novel writing is... Uh, it's not going to work, is it? Not for me. <laughs> but with, with findings, what, what, you know, you talk in there about finding the, seeing the birds when you're doing the laundry and, mm -hmm. you know, seeing the, the cobwebs and, you know, when you're tidying up or mm -hmm. whatever, how, how you <laughs> feed into uh -huh. the, the, the kind of natural world, writing about the natural world into the, the everyday, really. Um, one of my favourite poets is, is Holderlin. I just read that little Scots piece by Holderlin. Mm. Rilke loved Holderlin because he said Holderlin was one of the most exposed poets. I love Rilke because he's also exposed. And, and it's that sense of being open, like a cormorant drying its wings, being open to everything and not judging what fits and what doesn't fit, you know, and allowing that to feed into the writing. I like, I like that, I like making unexpected connections because they're unexpected to me. Mm. So you look up from dealing with the socks and you, you know, hear an oyster catcher. Why should those be separated from each other, mm. you know? And, and with, with, with Sightlines, the, the second collection of essays, you were able to go a bit wider. <laughs> One of the, the things you talked a lot in there was about, uh, take for example the relationship between humans and whales where you go and, you know, you go and help clean the whales at the Bergen Natural mm -hmm. History Museum. Mm -hmm. But that may lead you to reflect on how, you know, we, our attitude to say whales mm -hmm. as one, just one example, is so mm -hmm. inconsistent. Yeah, we, we love bonkers. them, but we... You know, Completely we, bonkers. Industrial slaughter. Yeah. Well, the days of industrial slaughter are, are over, at least in this part of the world. So we have had a, 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 a turnaround in attitude mm -hmm. there. But it's, it's a pity for that one species that that should be the arena where our, our completely dysfunctional relationship with other animals is played out. It's tough on the whales, isn't mm. it? I don't think squirrels, for example, have to put up with this lunacy, you know, that is our relationship with them. Yeah. So, um... There's a wonderful moment in the book where you, there's a sign which says, don't touch the whales, and you say, well, <laughs> that's all we've ever done with them, really, <laughs> in a way. No, so. yeah. Yes. I didn't see any whales last year. That's a bad thing. I have to go next year and look for, look for whales. And you do, that, that's something which you do travel around a lot, but, but you know, you go to St Kilda and mm -hmm. Rona and so on. Mm -hmm. and, um, and these, are, these are relatively close by. Yeah. You know, they, these are just in the Hebrides. Mm -hmm. They feel very far away. Rona in particular feels very far away. But they're not. They're part of the same archipelago as here. Yeah. You touched on... It's, it's, you touched on politics and the Scottish election. You were very much in favour of Scottish independence. Mm -hmm. I, you, I, I voted yes, that's what you mean. Sorry? I voted yes. Yeah, you voted yes, mean, yeah, yes. that's fine. But what about other issues about politics and so on with, with the environment? One of the things that Coleridge, for example, and this is not a test, he, you know, he got himself involved <laughs> in, in the local mm -hmm. politics, mm -hmm. very much against the slave mm -hmm. trade and yeah. debating religion mm -hmm. and so on. When it comes to the environment, what kind of political issues concern you and how do you... How do you address those? You, you, I read you said you're not an activist in the... No, I'm not an activist, I'm, I'm a writer. Yeah. I think, I, I don't think I could bear being an activist. I don't think I would still be here, mm. you know. This, this, this peculiar way is my way of relating to, to these issues. Um, I, I don't know, I don't know. Don't we all despair now and again? But one of the things that you, uh, I read, you re reviewed, a, um, the book Four Fields, and that you talked in there about how you know the, 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 in, in nature writing or environmental writing is not escapist because oh, no, that's where you see no. where the, the kind of sharp um, end of what's yeah, going exactly on. Yeah, so, and that's what these these writers have, have taught us. That there was a very snotty piece in the paper <clears throat> about a year ago, and somebody clipping on, gunning on about you know nature writers being middle class escapists, and that. And you think, no, that's actually everybody who doesn't engage with nature is, is deluded, you know, and the, the natural world is where the most frightening, most profound changes are happening, you know, and the bravest people, braver than me, are those who go and, and sit with that, you know, contemplate that, because that's, 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 that's where it's happening. Yeah. But you must see it in your own work, how over, say, 30 years you, when I, mean, I certainly see, you know, my question I was asked is where have all the starlings gone? Because I used to see lots of them and I can't mm -hmm. see them now. Where have all know. the sparrows gone? You know. Where are the so, hares? Yeah. yeah. You know? 
What, what, what should, is there a role for a writer in all of this, or is it? Well, you tell me. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, I just write the stuff. Yeah. If there's a space for it or a role for it, that's why. People are here, so there must be, mm. there must be something must be. Oh, I don't know. I just write it. And what about, um, I mean, one of the things that, and I did a lot of work in Scotland, and I was really quite impressed, which I rarely am with a political campaign, how that independence campaign played out. You, it was very exciting. Yeah, it was, yeah. you know, lively. Mm -hmm. there, there was a genuine debate about mm -hmm. ideas mm -hmm. right across the country, it seemed. Mm -hmm. I mean, where, where, you, where you lived and, and St Andrews, where you, mm -hmm. you teach, what, what was it like in those areas? Well, thankfully, I, I left St Andrews some years ago, but um, I was, I'm now teaching at Stirling. Oh, sorry, yeah. St Sterling, Andrews politically yeah. in every yeah. other way. It's another planet. Yeah. It's, um, it was, um, yeah, it's so, so exciting, so vibrant. Um, we just talked about nothing else, and, and the conversations one had with strangers about you know, <coughs> profound political issues, it was brilliant. Mm. I commend it to you, you should try it. <laughs> it was, it was, it was, um, I don't know what it was, I don't know what we lived through, whether it was a revolt, I think it was partially a revolt, you know, a genuine desire to break up the United Kingdom, for many of us, that seems to be the only solution now. But um, but it was it was fabulous, and I'm sorry it's over. No, I'm not sorry it's over. My blood pressure couldn't stand it. But, you know. but it's likely to come back, isn't it? It's uh, it's not going to go away. Oh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, and then what you know was how artists and poets mm -hmm. and others were so centrally involved in the political, much like you know Coleridge was here. I at suppose, the time, yeah. you know. And that, and mm -hmm. often led by them or leading the debate mm -hmm. and so on. So, yeah, our, our artists are all politicised, and uh, we, we don't find that odd. But possibly for historical reasons, there was a time until very recently when Scotland had no parliament. It was only fifteen years old, yeah. you know, and and so much of the work, the political work, having no place, political place, so much of that devolved to the artists to do, right up until nineteen ninety seven. You know, the devolution mm. campaign, that was largely driven by the artists, yeah. just because there was nobody else. Mm. Yeah. Could I just ask you a couple more things about your work and then we'll open it up. The mm. first is about how you, quite a lot was made of this, and, but you know, reading how important it is, is how you, you don't see na the wild or nature as simply the otter or the primrose. You talk about it being our own bodies, about cells sure. and so mm. on. How, just talk a little bit about that because that really took this in a new direction, I thought. Well, it seems to me odd that that should be remarkable. Mm. It seems to be obvious, you know, we, we, are, we, are in, we, are, we are bodies, we have bodies. We're, you know, that's our way of being in the world. So our, our livers and spleens and all the rest of it are as natural, as much part of the natural world as, as starlings and hares, you know. And um, one, of the, one of the essays in this book, I went to, stood beside a pathologist at our local teaching hospital while he, while he went through his days of work, just to do that, to understand what was going on you know, deep within our own bodies. I think had I had another life, I would like to have been a medic of some sort. Oh, really? But, um, it's not, it's not going to happen now, is it? So, but I, I, I'm not squeamish like that. I, I find it, I think it's the business of looking mm. again, you know. Mm. You have wonderful bird watchers whose look is external, and then these pathologists whose look is acute, sharp, you know, you need somebody, if you've got a, a, a tumour that's looking a bit iffy, you need somebody who's looking at it very hard, you know. I was greatly reassured, actually. I was greatly reassured to, to know what happens in these places. They have no, I'm not frightened of them now. Yeah. But partly was generated by your own family and illnesses within yes, the family. Yes, of course. Uh -huh. yeah. We all have families and they all, you know, people get ill, people die. This is, this is the way we are in the world, mm. you know. And um, you're doing a poem a week. You, no, I did. It's over you did. Now. Okay. What, what, <laughs> what, what about teaching creative writing? Mm -hmm. is, is that possible? It's often said, you know, it's difficult to teach creative writing. I don't see that it's... It's, it's certainly possible, mm. of course. If, if, it, if it's learnable, then it's teachable. Mm. And, you know, I have, I have and I'm learning how to be a writer. So if you can find a way of turning that around and enabling... Mm are offering people space, which is often all it is, just giving people space and time mm. to foreground their own work and to think about it, then yes, of course that's possible. Mm. And, and what are you doing, what, what are you working on now? Um, you doing a project in Alaska? 
Yeah, I went to Alaska to an archaeological dig. It's happening in the, in the I don't see there. The people there are Yupik, you know, Eskimo settlement. And um, they have global warming in spades there. It's, it's happening much more quickly there than here. Their coastline is eroding very quickly. And this archaeological site, an old village, was, was exposed because of the coastline falling into the sea. So they were losing, no sooner had they discovered this ancient village, they were losing it to the sea. So they called in archaeologists pretty quickly. And there's been a, a dig going on there for four or five seasons now. What's coming out is um, things from the Yupik culture before contact, of course. So the, the, these people who've taken such a hit, you know, culturally have been so damaged by, you know, us basically. Europeans, missionaries, God knows all what, um, are rediscovering their own culture just as the ice is melting and, and it's all being lost to the sea. It's, it's so replete with irony. Anyway, I went, the, the dig, for various reasons, is being conducted by Aberdeen University, which is how I got to hear about it. So I went out there for a month last summer to see how, how it was and, and what an Eskimo settlement was like, you know? It's like the Hebrides. You know? <laughs> Except, except, like, Stornoway is 500 miles away or something. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it wasn't so unfamiliar after all. But the, 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 the things, the artefacts that were coming out of the ground, were, was, you know, they're astonishing. So the idea is that they're coming back here, getting catalogued, and then all going to be shipped back out where they belong. Yeah. And, and what, what are, you, are you... Is this an essay or a...? It's a, nothing yet. It's nothing just good. a pile of notes. Yeah. I don't know. Hello. Hi. Wonderful poems, thank you. Um, could you talk a little bit more about this word nature? You've just made the point about the body. Mm -hmm. um, but I get the feeling the, the very word nature puts it all out there. It's to do with others and other mm -hmm. situations, other relationships. It's not really to do with us. And my sense is that if we don't relearn that we are nature, mm -hmm. then we'll never get out of this mess. Well, yes, I'm inclined to agree. I do, it's, it's, it's such a, it's an appalling word, isn't it? I can't actually speak with any, any sense about the word nature. It's just kind of mad. It's like, that's all there is. It's everything. Everything derives from the natural world eventually, doesn't it? Plastics, oil, everything. You know? So, no, that, that um, we're both in it and we're also enough out of it to be able to comment upon it and be conscious of it, which is our, our human condition, I guess. But one of the things you talked about in, in, is about how, the, how reliant wild life is on humans and how one day, mm. perhaps we're there now, that mm. um, no species will ever be able to act independently anymore. Mm. It's always in relation to yes. us or we yeah, have some kind so. of management... Mm. Control. Management rule, or, or yeah. you know, or, or they have chemicals in their bodies which mm. are you know been taken up from us. Yes, it's a, it's a terrible thought, isn't it? And that comes up in your work on, say, the the, the corn crakes, and mm. uh, as much as it does on whales, as much as it does on on um, small birds and so on. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm sorry. The reason I'm not an activist, not an issue, is I just I don't know. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask you about your children and whether or not you've been able to inspire them um, with your love of nature uh, against the backdrop <laughs> of um, digital advances, for the want of a better way of putting it. <laughs> well, my son took advantage of the digital advances to, to send me a text recently saying he'd just seen a kite in, in Creef, which is... <laughs> um, my husband's been a greater influence on the kids than I have because um, he's, a, he's a climber, he's a mountaineer, so my son's a great one for the hills, so he gets that off his dad. My daughter just wants to go shopping. <laughs> but then she's 17, I think she'll grow out of it. You talk about you've been away in a wind-ravaged place and so on, you left your husband <laughs> to look after the children, you came back and he seemed in a worse condition than you did. So, so. Yes. The days are over. Five days of... Infants. <laughs> uh, I just wonder if you could um, tell us a bit about how you how you construct your poems. Whether you s start with um, uh, scraps of 
writing that you actually do outdoors when you're walking or cycling, um, or whether it's all done, that the, the thoughts are in your head when you're outdoors and you put them onto paper when you come indoors? Mm, a, bit, a bit of both, I suppose. I carry a notebook and never use it. I carry it for like a, a talisman or something. Um, when I'm writing poems, they often start on the backs of old envelopes, which I keep specially. Brown manila envelopes, I like them. And um, I, like, I like envelopes because they're, they're scrap paper, and so you don't get to up yourself. You know, it's, uh, if, if, you know these gorgeous notebooks that are like, like thick paper with sort of petals and muesli and, and stuff in them? They're lovely, lovely and useless. You know? Useless because you don't feel you can sully them with, with your crappy words, yeah, that's no use. You want a piece of paper that you can easily sully, yeah, and so that's why I like old envelopes. So then you can write a load of garbage all over them and nobody's going to care. And so that's, that's where a poem starts. So I, I write envelope full of unbelievable rubbish and then, and then starts the work of dowsing, understanding what's in it that wants to be a poem. And when I'm, when I'm writing, you know, properly made poems. That, that process can take weeks and weeks. I love it. It's, 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 like, it's like having a secret affair. You're just so in love with this thing that's going, you know, this reciprocity that's happening there. And then the poem's finished and then, it, and then it's over. Hi. Hi. Um, just to lead on from that point is, do you feel like your poetry writing is quite a, a personal, private um, activity that you take part in? Or is it something that feels bigger than you? How many people are in this room? 280. <laughs> That's bigger than me. <laughs> well, I'll tell, I'll tell you what um, I tell my, my writing students. Here is, here is my notebook. Yeah? Full of stuff and nonsense. Yeah? And here's the finished product. This is, is private in the sense I would be embarrassed to let you read it. This I'd be glad for you to read. Yeah? So between these two things, there's an awful lot of sheets of paper and old envelopes in that. But... but um, this is, as I say, private in the sense that ah, it's unformed, it's, it's underdressed, it's, you know, in its dressing gown. Days of Beals, as I say, in Scotland. But this, this is in the public domain, you know, and it, isn't it wonderful that 200 people will, will know about this and want to read it? So, so it's like getting from there to there. You know, you're talking about teaching, that's what I try and teach, how to uh, get from there mm. to there. Mm. And it's all the stuff in the middle that you can teach. You can't teach people how to keep notes and how to look and how to think and how to write down nonsense. You can only implore them to do it. You know? But you can help with the crafting and, and the rewriting mm. and the listening to the poem as mm. it's being made and ending up with something worth, worth publishing. Um, you said you hadn't made much study of the romantics in English. Um, and you also said that you like your poems to be very spare. You believe in cutting down the number of words. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you've studied Japanese and Chinese classical poetry, if you have any grasp of those, any comments? Um, I, I wouldn't say studied, but I certainly have read cl Chinese classical poetry. And Basho, of course, is one of my <coughs> favourite writers. So, yes, I do like that. But I couldn't, I couldn't discuss on it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are various books you refer to that have been very influential. So classic is J.A. Baker's book, and, mm -hmm. um, but there's others as well. I mean, do you read other writers in a similar, I don't I say nature writers, but it's... Um, no, I, do, I don't read nature writers as, as that. Um, I, might, I, I tend to fixate mm. on two or three books a year, which I just live with, mm. you know, and, and nothing else will do. And then that phase passes and something else comes along. But they're not necessarily nature writers, you know. It's just somebody, a really poet, so I lock into poets mm. and just think, how are you doing that? So, so it's an act of theft. And, and, so, and I'm not going to name names. Could you tell us a little bit more about your uh, remark about a properly made poem? Are you talking about your, the structural nature yeah. of the poem mm. or the ideas that contain within it or both? No, the, the construction. Um, for example, the poems in this book were... For me, quite carefully made. There you are, you see, that there are how many? Six, seven or eight four line stanzas, and I would have paid an awful lot of attention to getting these stanzas balanced right and worrying about the enjambments and listening to the, the, you know, all the assonance and the consonants and that. And that's what takes the weeks and weeks of work, and it's very satisfying to do. 
But these new ones, when I thought, I just want to speed this up a bit and see what happens. They don't look like that at all. The lineation's all to hell and I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I meant. Um, just spending a little less time and winging it, and just, just as an experiment, just to see if it, um, it was possible to write in such a way. It was great fun. I don't know if I would, I would maintain it, because I do, I do like this finicking and, you know, careful. Yeah. I do, I do like doing this. This um, It's more of a reflection than a question. Um, just thinking of some things you said, I would describe myself in some ways as an activist and um, in a world where I find myself talking about economics quite a lot and mm. um, there's quite a lot of competition to know the scientific facts and to prove that you know exactly what you're talking about before you're able to make comment on it. Mm. I found it, far be it from me to suggest you should be in the mind, body, soul section, I found it a <laughs> sense of mindfulness. I found it very calming and reassuring to mm, read. Good. It grounded me, the, I read findings recently, and it grounded me to to see that someone could just go out and observe and have a meaningful things to say, despite not having to apply the exact scientific oh, yes. knowledge to the yes, thing. You, and I yes. just found that very reassuring. And yes. that sense of ecology of us being something within mm -hmm. the world and not something outside of the world looking upon it. So I found that very calming and reassuring. Good, Thank so you. that's a very kind thing for you, you to see. It reminds me of, 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 of <coughs> something an ornithologist said to me. Uh, she. I had to know the facts, know the figures. She had to be scientific and dread word objective. What the hell is that? Anyway, she had to do this thing. And she said, um, she, she was working this species of birds that was on the way out and she, she was crying and saying, I, you know, I love these birds. And she's not allowed to say, I love these birds. What a mess are we in? You know, if, if somebody who knows the birds so well is not allowed to say, you know, I love them and I'm weeping because I think they're, they're in trouble, you know. But I can do that. So, so for her and for people like you, I can do that. That's a good thing to do. So you're asking me if it's any worth. Maybe that's its worth. Okay, well, that's yeah. a good, good result. Um, yes, please, the gentleman there. I'd like to return, if I may, to a question that we've already touched on. Um, and it was, um, my question is provoked by a, a garden profile that I read, where the words following was attributed to you, I, I think. Um, it's not about voice, it's about listening and the art of listening listening with attention. I don't just mean with the ear. Bringing the quality of attention to the world. The writers I like best are those who attend. When I read these words of yours, I gather, I wondered how best could I attend? Um, um, how can I live a life of attention? And I surmise that I may be able to do so, or better able to do so, if I remembered that all we ever have is the moment. That's it. All we ever have is the moment. Yeah. Um, which begs the question, is that true or not? But uh, So I, I read around it a little and thought around it a little and I was fortified in that belief when I came across the following lines in a, a book written by a lady called Elizabeth Colber in the flyleaf, words attributed to Georges Louis Borges. And the words are, centuries of centuries, and only in the present do things happen, end quote. Um, it seemed to me that my attention would be best if I remembered that um, all we ever have is the moment. Would yeah. you be in the card? What would you think of that? Is that a, like a good way to go, if I want to be a good attender? <laughs> Better to live in the moment. You, you talk about what, do, in but, one of the books, about how, yeah, what we might find in five, people remember in 5,000 years' but, time. But I also love the sense of deep time, yeah. you know. I do like a sense of archaeological layers and geological layers of time as well. I just wondered if, after what you said about constructing a poem, what you might say about constructing a sentence or a paragraph in prose, mm -hmm. Because I do think your prose is some of the most sort of beautifully sprung <laughs> that oh, I thank know. You. Um, and it's not so often talked about in the same way, and mm. perhaps it should be. Oh, that's a very kind of thing to say. I don't, I don't bring the same attention to um, the prose sentence by sentence mm. as I do to the poems. But maybe, maybe I learn enough from writing poems to then inflect it on the, on the prose. 
Um, what do I do? I think of the poem, I think of the, the essays as extended poems rather than truncated novels, you know, non-fiction. They're, they're, they're poems that they're most relaxed. A sort of, um, what do you call that thing? Uh, you know when you're car maintenance manuals, exploded diagrams, you know, the essays are like exploded diagrams of a poem. And the poem, you ought to shove all that together and make it spin, you know. So they are more relaxed, but a lot of the, the techniques of poetry writing I, I do try and bring into the prose. And that may just be as simple as changing a word because it has a, a more, you know, is for the euphony of it, you know, more assonance or something, you know. Um, thank you very much for coming and join with me in thanking Kathleen Jamie. <laughs>